We entitled this series, A Beautiful Mess. Uh, pretty much, as you can tell from the title, we have walked through Paul's letter to the Corinthians, uh, and we have walked through a letter in which he really communicates to them the reality that God loves them. They are so loved by God. They have been blessed by God. They have been sanctified by God. They have been given every spiritual gift by God. God has blessed this church. God has communicated to them his amazing love. And yet at the same time, we see that it's a church that is a full of mess, a complete mess. Uh, we have seen Paul address all kinds of things going on in this church. Anything from divisions amongst the brethren to sexual promiscuity to the type of immoral, immoral behavior that not even pagans engage in. Uh, that's what Paul tells them. Not even pagans engage in the type of immoral behavior that I see amongst you. Right? In fact, it, it is so bad that Paul comes to a place in his dealings with them in chapter 11 and verse 17 that he tells them that their gatherings are not for the better, but they are for the worse. The Corinthians are so gifted and so loved by God, yet because of their overemphasizing of self and then their de-emphasizing of the gospel, they are a church that behaves worse than pagans. That's what Paul tells them. Now, I wish I had the time to give you guys an overview of everything that we have seen over the past 14 chapters, but we don't have that. We, it took us about nine months to get through that, and so if you want an overview, go to our YouTube channel, go to our website, and you could check out all the messages that Pastor Jonathan and I have there, uh, and, and even some of, the, uh, some of the, the brothers that preach here as well uh, are there. You can listen to them. But the reason why I speak to you a little bit about the background of the letter is because it's very important for us to understand regarding the Corinthians that the Corinthian church is not much different than the church in Miami. Because the main issue that we are going to learn today is our failure to hold on to the gospel message that we have received. That is the problem with the Corinthian church. They have failed to hold on to the gospel message that they have received. And that happens to us here in Miami. That happens to uh, the, the, the church in the 21st century here in, in, in North America. You see, Paul has given many practical instructions to us through the Corinthians. He has given instructions regarding worship services and how men are to lead and how women are to behave in the congregation and how the uh, Holy Communion is to be examined and exercised and how we ought to view leaders and how we ought to love one another and view spiritual gifts. So much information on, on the way that we are supposed to deal and interact with one another with in the context of the worship of the church but as we get to the home stretch as we get to the end of the letter and we come to chapter 15 Paul is about to summarize all his instructions into the most important thing for us to do and for us to embrace because he's about to tell us that without receiving, without standing in, without holding on to the gospel, everything else Paul has instructed us is meaningless. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is about to remind us of what the gospel is and what our response to it should be. It's, all, it's, it's almost as if Paul is saying, listen, uh, uh, I'm coming to, to the close. I'm, I'm about to finish the letter, and now I need to make it clear to you that what matters most, what will make everything else I have asked of you uh, worthwhile, the instructions that I have given you, the guidance that I have given you, listen, what really makes this work is the reality that you must receive, you must stand in, and you must hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying. That is Paul speaking to us through the Corinthian letter. And so let's, let's read it together. Chapter 15 
and see how Paul summarizes everything that he's been teaching for 14 chapters, and he does so in this one chapter, and we're going to read verses 1 through 19. And this is what Paul says to us. He says this, Now, I want to make clear for us, or for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold on to the message I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then even Christ has been raised. Has, has, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. I pray that the Holy Spirit would come. Holy Spirit, come. We welcome you to teach us and guide us and reveal to us the beauties of Christ. And Lord, I pray, forgive this sinner who's here standing preaching. Lord, but I stand here only in the merits of Christ. May you speak through me, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me give you a story that's going to help us sort of illustrate what we're seeing here in these verses. Uh, I heard a story once of a man, I don't know if it was real, I don't know if it was true or not, but a man took his car to the mechanic for repairs. He ignored the signs posted in the garage that told customers to keep out of the working area. And so, you know, you kind of know when you're doing some kind of work, handiwork on someone's car or, you know, someone's house. And all of a sudden, that person is like right there watching every move you make. And so this man is in the work area of the mechanic shop, and he's there. He's watching every move that the mechanic is making. He's, he's looking at everything that the mechanic is doing. The mechanic starts getting annoyed. The mechanic begins to, you know, just feel like, man, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this idiot. Like, he's like, man, I can't do anything. He's right on top of me, right? And so the mechanic comes to the man, and he uh, grabs him by the shoulders and says, hey, come on, come over here. Walks him sort of outside of the work area. He comes, he gets a piece of chalk, and he draws a circle on the ground, and he tells the man to stand in the, inside the circle, and he says, look, I'm working in your car. I need space. I need you to stand right here in this circle and don't move out of here until I finish working on your car. So the mechanic goes back to the person's car, and when he looks back, this man has a big grin on his face. You know, he has a big grin. He's kind of like, like a silly smirk. You know what that looks like, right? You have kids, right? And you, you tell them something, they give you like a silly smirk. Or your husband, I do that all the time. You know, Christine's like, why are you looking at me that way? But, uh, you know, so you have a silly, the guy has a silly smirk, and the mechanic 
is looking at the guy. It's like, man, this guy is just rubbing me the wrong way. And the guy keeps smiling and laughing. So the mechanic gets sick and tired. He grabs a, a, a sledgehammer. And he says, okay, let, let's see if he laughs about this. He, he comes and he hits the car on the fender. And then he looks at the owner of the car who's, you know, off to the side over there. And the guy has a bigger smile on his face. And he's like, what's wrong with this guy? And so he goes and he hits it again. And then he looks at the guy and the guy has an even bigger, the guy's like folding down laughing. You know, and then he's like, man, what, what's wrong with this idiot? So he starts hitting the car all over the place. And the guy's cracking up to the side over there. And so the mechanic drops the hammer, goes over to the guy, goes to the circle, says to the guy, hey, what's, what's so funny? And the owner of the car says to the mechanic, Every time you turned around and you weren't looking at me, I stepped out of the circle. <laughs> now, you might say that man was an idiot, right? And you would be right. He was taking seriously something meant to be taken lightly, and he was taking lightly something that was rather serious. But you know what, church? Many of us, even though we would laugh at this example, many of us do the very same thing. We make much of things that should be taken lightly and things that should be taken very seriously, we make light of. And that's what Paul is dealing with when it comes to the Corinthians. Many times we emphasize so many things and in the process we de-emphasize the one thing that truly matters. We're so worried about being better people and we're so worried about doing our religious duties and we're so worried about how we people view us and, and do I look like a good Christian? Am I a good Christian? We're so worried about all these things and we de-emphasize the one thing that truly matters. We neglect our own souls. We neglect the souls of others with the nurture of the gospel. And instead of us eating gospel, we eat self. We're all about self. How I look, how people perceive me, what value I have, what worth I have. Instead of placing our sights on the one thing that truly matters. We're like the idiots at the mechanic shop. We take something seriously that has no value whatsoever instead of taking seriously the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is going to give us a proposition here. And we could put it up. Paul really here is calling us to hold to the message I preach to you. That's what Paul is saying. He, he's going to summarize everything that he's been instructing us for 14 chapters. He's talked to us about so many different things. And yet he's going to summarize it to one thing. Hold to the message I preach to you. He wants us to hold to the gospel. And according to Paul, the gospel should be the preeminent message of our lives. It should be our occupation. And by that, I don't mean that all of you now should leave your jobs and go preach the gospel for a living. That's not what I'm saying. But it should be the one thing that we are mainly preoccupied with, the gospel. So many churches view the gospel as simply the ABCs of the Christian walk. Or may I say it this way? We view the gospel as if the gospel was the kindergarten of the Christian walk. You know, it's kind of the kindergarten where we go and we do colors of the cross and we kind of, you know, think about Jesus and, and what Jesus did for us. But eventually we have to move on. We have to move on, you know, to grade school and we have to move on to college and we have to move on to, you know, post-grad school and, and we have to learn more deeper things about the Bible. No, the gospel is not just the kindergarten of the Christian life. The gospel is the kindergarten and the gospel is all the way to the doctorate of the Christian life, we will never exhaust what we learn as we stand on and hold on to the gospel. The gospel is it. 
There's nothing greater. There's nothing deeper. There's nothing better. The gospel is it. The problem with the Corinthians was that that as loved as they were by God, as gifted a church as they were by the Holy Spirit, they had moved away from the gospel and they were paying attention, more attention to their own wisdom, to their own rhetoric, to their own gifting, and ultimate their own understanding of worth and justification before God. And we do the same thing, church. We do the same thing. And when we do that, we become a mess. The safest place for us as believers to be guarded by the loving arms of gospel clarity. That's the safest place. You want to be a Christian that is guarded. You want to be a Christian that is growing. You want to be a Christian that is understanding the depths of the beauties of God. You have to be a Christian that is, that is embraced by the loving arms of gospel clarity. Gospel clarity. Because we are so bound to constantly move away from the very truth of the gospel. And so before we realize what Paul means to hold on to the message of the gospel, we need to understand what the gospel is and how exactly it is that we hold on to it, right? So here's our, here's our driving question for us. What exactly is the gospel? And why is it a message that we must hold on to? What exactly is the gospel? And why is it a message that we must hold on to, okay? Okay. Three points. Number one, the gospel defined. Let's define the gospel. Look at verses 3 and 4 in our passage, chapter 15. Look with me. It says this. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So the first thing we learn about the gospel, and there's two things that I really want to pop out from this verse, right, from these two verses right here, and you can put them on the screen. It's two things. It's, the me it's a message. We need to understand that the gospel is a message. Uh, look at what Paul says in verse 3. He says, for I passed on to you, right? What did he pass on to you? That which he received. And so this is so important to grasp because in today's Christianity, the gospel has become many things, right? It has become uh, moral behavior. The gospel becomes moral behavior. The gospel becomes social engagement. The gospel becomes this motivational speech. It becomes human and betterment projects. That's what it becomes. But Paul tells us here in verse 3 that he passed on to us something. And in verse 2, we see what he passed on to us. He passed a message. He says, the message that I delivered to you, he passed a message, a message that he himself had received. And we know from the opening chapters of Galatians that Paul received it from Jesus himself. Paul preaches the gospel. In, in other words, he shares the gospel with his communication skills. Why? Because the gospel is not something we do. It's something we communicate. You understand that? The gospel is not something we do. It's something that we communicate. It is a message. I have gone to so many Christian conferences. That's why I don't go anymore, honestly. But I have gone to so many Christian conferences where they have a workshops on how to live the gospel. Listen, church. We don't live the gospel. We proclaim the gospel. We preach the gospel. And at the other end of that proclamation, the gospel is received. We don't live the gospel. I can't emphasize enough this morning how, how making the gospel to be more than just a message meant to be received is stupidity. I can't emphasize it enough. It's not just stupidity, but counterproductive to the Christian walk. Let me explain that a little bit. Let me explain that quickly. 
You guys remember the example of the idiot in the mechanic shop, right? Okay, so here is placing, he, he was placing his attention on what the mechanic had asked him to do and making fun of the mechanic. All the while, the mechanic is bashing his car. When we make the gospel something that we do, what we're doing is the very same thing. We are placing all our attention on, okay, how am I walking? Okay, am, am, I, am I living out the gospel? Am I, you know, doing enough social justice issues in the gospel? Am I, you know, we're, we're placing our attention on ourselves like idiots instead of placing the attention on the message. The message we receive, the message we believe, the message we stand on, the message that we hold on to. And so it becomes counterproductive. Instead of us growing in our understanding of the gospel, instead of us being transformed by the very gospel that we receive and believe, instead of us growing as Christians, guess what? We become, like, we become like Peter in the water, walking in the water, looking to Jesus. And as soon as he stops looking to Jesus, he sinks. Because looking to anything else that is not Jesus Christ and him crucified and resurrected from the grave will make us sink. The gospel takes our eyes off of ourselves. This is the reason, the reason why Jesus says, if you will follow me, you must take up your cross. What does that mean? It means you die. You no longer live your life looking at your performance as the basis of your standing, but you die on the cross just as Jesus did. And now you live your life looking at the gospel as the basis of your standing. See, somehow we have been made to believe that if we do this, well, it's simply not enough. For you to simply believe a message and receive it and, 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 taste, and taste it and, and embrace it and continually look at it and go over it, for you to do that, that's not enough. That's what you've been preached. It's not enough. If that's all you do, that's not the gospel. You need to do more. Wrong! gospel is a message and it's not a message about us it's a message about christ it's about christ look at verse three again where it says here's the message that i delivered to you that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures do, do you see a pattern there what, what does he say? What is the message about? What is the gospel message? Christ died. He was buried. He was raised. That is the message. There's no Jose Prado there. You see that? The only Jose Prado there, guess what it is? My sin. And that's not good news. That's the bad news. That's the reason why Jesus had to die. Listen to me, listen to me. Our life, church, our life before God was the reason Jesus died. Let that sink in. Every single human being in the history of mankind, regardless of how good or how bad they lived, was deserving of the condemnation that Jesus Christ took upon himself on that cross. The good news of the gospel is not how awesome, you know, we deal with social injustice. The good news of the gospel is not how awesome we change our moral behavior. The good news of the gospel is not how awesome we sacrifice 
all our earthly treasures for the transformation of the world. The good news of the gospel is Jesus. He is the gospel. We are the bad news. We are the reason why he died. So let's stop being so arrogant. Let's stop being so prideful thinking somehow we live the gospel and our lives and our living is the gospel. No, the gospel as Paul puts it here in our text is Jesus. He lived for us. He died for us. He was raised for us. That is the gospel we have received in which we stand and which we hold on to. Second point. Man, this year started good. Thank you, Jesus. Your word is good. Point number two, the gospel witnessed. You see, the gospel is not Paul's fairy tale. Paul wants the Corinthians to understand this. He wants them to know the definition of the gospel, and then he wants them to understand that, listen, I'm not telling you some sort of story that I made up, but I'm actually bringing to you something that has been witnessed. Look at verse 5. He says, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. And to all the apostles, last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And so here we have two types of witnessing, okay? Number one, and we can put it on the slide. Number one, we have the witness of Scripture. Scripture gives testimony of this message, right? He says that Christ died for our sins. What, how? How? Where do we see that? According to the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. Where? According to the Scriptures. Paul wants us to know that the gospel we have received, in which we stand, what we hold on to has a witness, and that witness is God himself. God in his word has given witness to the gospel. Every Sunday morning, I wake up early. And on Sunday mornings that I'm preaching, I wake up about an hour, hour and a half earlier. And the reason why I do that is because I like to take a shower. You know, my hair takes about an hour to do. Um, <laughs> no joke, no joke, all right? Anyways, uh, um, and, and then I like to go to the office and, you know, just do some more work on my notes and, you know, think about the, the sermon and stuff. And so, and so I do that. And uh, this morning I took, I took a shower. You know, Christine was asleep. And then, uh, um, you know, it was like 6 in the morning. So I put on the TV and... Um, I'm not going to say the name, but there was a, a, a very well-known preacher preaching, and he was preaching from Genesis, the story of Joseph. And here was his big crescendo. He, here was his, his big, you know, uh, message that he had to deliver to thousands of people in this church. Seven principles of how we become more than conquerors. So we're going to look at the life of Joseph, and we're going to learn seven principles of how we become more than conquerors. Now, you can ask Christine. She was like half asleep, and I'm just arguing with the guy on the TV. You idiots! The Joseph story is not in Genesis so that we can be, re, re, be become more than conquerors or so that we can become the heroes of the story but it's there to remind us of the faithfulness of God in using Joseph as a shadow of Jesus Christ to save his people from God's judgment against the land like Jesus Joseph is despised by his brothers like Jesus, Joseph is arrested and condemned. But like Jesus, Joseph is then given a place of authority by which he saves God's rebellious people. 
Joseph is not a conqueror outside of the faithfulness of God's promises in Jesus Christ. And the scriptures are all like that. They're not about you. They're not about us becoming conquerors or us becoming better people. They're about Jesus. The scriptures bear witness of our Lord Jesus. He's an amazing, amazing. He's amazing. And yet we dabble with stupidity. He is beautiful to see in the Old Testament. He's beautiful to see in the life of David. He's beautiful to see in the Psalms. He is beautiful to see in the prophets. And yet we preach stupidity. The gospel has a witness. And the witness is the scriptures that proclaim Jesus from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelations 21. Jesus is what's being witnessed. But it has another witness as well, and that's the witness of the church. Look at verse 5. It says, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then all to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. And so we have believed the message that has been witnessed by God's word, and it also has been witnessed by the testimony of brothers and sisters that throughout the history of the church, brothers and sisters that at that time when Paul wrote this letter were still alive, who had seen Jesus with their own eyes. I mean, just think about that. Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthian church, and there are living brothers and sisters that they can actually go to and ask, did you see Jesus? And they would say, man, he looked beautiful. But that's not the only witness. We also see the witness of a life that is standing in the gospel. And look at what Paul says about his life. He says in verse 12, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, actually, I'm sorry, this is, what, this is what, in verse 12, we're actually seeing, you know, what they were starting to say. They were starting to move away from the gospel, right? But then Paul shows them, and Paul shows them their, his life. He gives them testimony of his life. He says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Church, in my fallen state, embracing my sin and knowing how unworthy I am of such love by God, I can follow a man that speaks this way. The Corinthians actually made fun of Paul. They made fun of him. They thought that they thought very low of Paul. He wasn't cool enough for them. He wasn't godly enough for them. He didn't speak or preach well enough for them. He wasn't successful enough to their liking. But Paul was a man that losers like me love following because his testimony had nothing to do with his greatness. And it had everything to do with the greatness of Jesus Christ and the grace that had been given to him. Church, I pray that that may be the testimony of Christ's family church. Not just now. Not just now. But it will be the testimony of our children and our children's children. That they will testify of the grace that they have received. Now listen, that grace changes us. That grace makes us be more about others than about ourselves. That grace gives us passion, passion we want to give to our children. Let me ask you a question, and I do this, look, I even ask this of myself, so please, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, condemning, but what do our children, what do our children, what would our children say we're passionate about? 
Is it about money? It's about vacations and, you know, having a bigger home, having more toys. What would our children say we're passionate about? What would our children say, you know, we we long for and we stand in and we hold on to? Where 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 do our children believe our security comes from? Does it come from how we behave, how people perceive us, what we do? Where? Or do our children know and believe the gospel? Do our children hear from us our need of Jesus Do our children hear us speak like Paul when he says, I I was not worthy to be called an apostle, for I am the least of them, for I was a blasphemer and I was a murderer. Do our children hear us speak that way? Or do our children hear us speak of our victories and our conquering and what a great Christian I am? Listen, our children need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the truth. They need to hear that we are nothing without Christ. They need to hear that our only hope in this life and our only comfort in life or death is nothing else but the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our children need. That's the testimony that I want this church to have. And I know Pastor Jonathan wants it too. And I, that is, that's what we want. That's what we're going to pray for three weeks and then have a worship prayer service, you know, on a Friday night. Why? Because we want to ask God to give us this testimony that we will proclaim the gospel. Well, lastly, I want to finish with this. I should have been done already, but let me finish with the last point, the gospel embrace. What does it look like? Okay, so we've seen the gospel, what it is, how it's witnessed, but now what what does it mean to hold on to it? So let's look at the gospel embrace. Verse 14 says this, and if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If then, if we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. What does embracing the gospel look like? Now, we know that the Corinthians were in danger of believing in vain. That's what Paul says. And Paul calls that pretty much what he means is that they were in danger of not believing the true gospel. Does it mean that they were in danger of losing their salvation? Okay. But what it means is that what have you believed? Because if you believe that Jesus Christ didn't raise from the the grave, then whatever you believed has been in vain. Because it's of no worth to you. Okay, and and, and so what I want to do this morning as we begin to land the plane here is I want us to see these not in negative implications of our distortion of the gospel, because that's what Paul is about to give them. He's about to give them the negative implications of what it means. If Christ has not been raised, you don't have any of this. Okay, that's the negative implications. But what we're going to see quickly here before we land the plane is we're going to see how embracing the gospel gives us these wonderful implications for those of us who have received it and those of us who hold on to it, okay? Number one, implication number one, we have assurance. Look at verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Listen, church, listen. If you embrace the message of the gospel, you have assurance, Your faith is not in vain. (laughs) Whatever suffering, whatever trials you go through in life, listen, it's not in vain. Okay? But you have this assurance that if Christ was raised, that the true gospel is truth, then listen, we have this amazing assurance and hope in Christ. Number two, we have God's truth. Uh, Look at the verse 15. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. In other words, listen, because we have embraced the gospel, 
not only do we have assurance, but we have God's truth. We, we don't have to shy away. I was at the barber shop yesterday. He was cutting my hair, you know, and man, this guy loves to talk, but he hates church. He really does. I mean, he has this antagonism against church. And so every time I'm there, he knows I'm a pastor. You know, he, he, he'll poke at me and ask me questions, especially if people are there. And so he's like, they're arguing this and that. I'm just throwing a little, little jabs here and there, you know. And, and, uh, and, and listen, no matter how foolish my message may look to him and to the people that were there at the barbershop, <laughs> I have God's truth. You get that? You know, like I don't have to shy down. I don't have to be worried. I don't, I have God's truth if I have embraced the gospel. All right. Uh, the other implications that we see is we have victory over death. Look at verse 16. For if, death, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. But listen, we have victory over death because Jesus did raise. I know right now there are families here that are dealing with death right before their eyes. In fact, the Machen family is not here today because they're in the hospital. And their grandmother is going to be, you know, un unplugged from a machine that's helping her breathe. And they're there because she might pass away, even right now as we speak. I know the Valdez family is also dealing with the same thing with their grandmother, you know. But listen to me. Christ has been raised. Christ has been raised. We have victory over death. Listen, even if we die, those who have embraced the gospel have victory over death. We will live. Death is not the last word. It's actually the entrance into glory. Also, we have priceless faith. Look at verse 17. It says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. But listen, our faith is not worthless. Our faith is the most valuable thing we have. Because it's not the amount of faith we have. Our faith could be the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed there is. But it's because of who, upon who our faith is on. It's on Jesus. And our faith is, 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 is priceless. Uh, we have power over sin. You know, the verse 17 says, you are still in your sins. Right? If we don't embrace the gospel, listen, you are still a child of condemnation. If you don't believe that Jesus lived and he died and he resurrected from the grave, then you are dead in your sins. But we, we, we have power over sin. Sin no longer controls us. We are free. Uh, we have eternal life. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. And lastly, we have purpose. Church, look at verse 19. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But because we have hold on to the gospel, then we're not pitiful people. We are people with a purpose to glorify him now and to enjoy him forever. Let us pray.